Hello everyone, it is so good to be back here with you today. I am Dr. Chris Martinson of Peak Prosperity. Today we're gonna to be talking about, is China preparing for war? The evidence says yes right now, but what do we mean by war? There's a little bit of a definition there, but let's take a look at what I mean. So I came across this article in the Brownstone Institute, great article, great site. I get a lot of my data from there, i read these things. This is by a Robin Corner of the title, uh, which I just use as the title of this video as well. Is China preparing for war? Question mark. Hmm, what could that mean? This is kind of interesting. So I gather data from wherever I find interesting data. Often it's at the edges. That's where you find things that are just developing. This is before things are proven. But of course, if you're good at it, you can figure out where the signals are coming from faster, sooner, better. And that's what I excel at. So if you like being early to stories, and I know you do, this is something that I want to bring to you now because there's clear signs right now, not imminent, not like tonight, but soon. Let's take a look at what I mean. This is a great anecdote. Well done, Robin Corner. He wrote here, quote, each year I have the pleasure of interviewing hundreds of applicants to the programs of an educational institute of which I am the academic dean. In, these inter in those interviews, excuse me, I ask questions that motivate prospective students, mostly age 15 to 18 years to share opinions that they care deeply about, but feel unable to discuss with their peers. I thus gain insight into a generation of whose experiences I, a Gen Xer, would otherwise be largely ignorant. So great frontline stuff here going after the students and asking them what's going on now. He happens to interview and talk to a lot of students coming from China. Now, as we all saw in COVID, hey, there were these early sort of videos that came out and there were you know people tipping over in streets and dead bodies everywhere and building 10,000 person hospitals and like a single weekend and stuff like that all of which turned out to have been actually well fool me once shame on you fool me twice won't get fooled again right so um to quote the famous uh, George W Bush so Robert Robin Corner here he is a British born citizen of the USA currently serves as academic dean of the John Locke Institute. Got a couple of graduate degrees, physics and philosophy. So what did he say here? This is interesting, this is really fascinating. He wrote, this year the most consequential discovery I made as a result of 700 such interviews concerned what I now believe may be the greatest danger facing the world. Subsequent events have strengthened my conclusion. Whereas extraordinary censorship has been the norm in China for many years, 2022 was the first year in which a large proportion of Chinese interviewees shared with me their concern about the ubiquity of specifically nationalistic propaganda and the complete removal of contrary content in all domains in their country. Ooh, sounds a little bit like Twitter pre-Elon as it concerns things like, oh, I don't know, uh, Dwizabin, Dwizabin one and two. If you don't know what those mean, those are my code words for things which shall not be named. Uh, in this case, drugs which shall not be named. Dwizabin is how I pronounce that acronym. So at any rate, uh, I, I totally sympathize. I know what it's like to live under a repressive authoritarian regime where the information is censored and controlled and shaped. So, have my sympathy. Now, carrying on, in the underlying part there, quote, an example cited by many Chinese applicants is the wholesale rewriting of history textbooks to delete any references to events that cannot be redwashed, my word, to fit a century of humiliation narrative. I'll get to that in a second. I was repeatedly told that the average Chinese person is now exposed to no other historical perspective. Hmm. So if you get out of the country, you might see some of this more of the article goes into how actually travels being more and more limited, but obviously the great mass of people in any country never get out of the country at all. So they wouldn't know anything other than the dominant narrative, which is being beamed to them all the time about this century of humiliation. So um, what is that century of humiliation? That was from 1839 to 1849. This is a really nice slide deck about it down there. Um, it comes to us uh, from USC. And uh, it's kind of, it's fascinating, but they're in their century of humiliation. Number one, the Opium Wars, that was when they were conducted. Britain had a trade deficit with China. They liked all their like silk and brocade fabrics and also they had a trade deficit. That means that their gold and silver was ending up in China. What do you do about that, you know? Well, they decided to sell opium after 1800 to balance the accounts. 
China opposed the opium. Now they're like, no, this isn't good for our people. So Britain attacked it in 1841. The defeat of China in the 1841 to 1860 opium wars led to 70 foreign treaty ports. Like, hey, we're coming in, we got a port here. And of course, not to their advantage, very asymmetrical, very bad deals, if you can call them deals at all. And, you know, we had the United States in on that and, um, you know, all sorts of countries were actually part of that. So that was their century of humiliation. And of course, you think they remember that still? You think 1949, you think this is still part of their memory set? Actually, we could go more, we could go deeper than this and closer in time and we could find that there's been a lot of humiliation and that's no bueno. And of course, nobody actually likes to be humiliated, but particularly I think China is gonna say no more to that. So this is what we're talking about with the century of humiliation. Now, this is the kind of stuff that I do and I surface data like this. So, hey, I'm gonna put on my uh, sponsor hat for just a second and tell you about this incredible website my website. Uh, we have great people coming here. This is our resilience community right here. If you want to become resilient, if you're at all concerned about where things are going. In fact, please, in the comments below, please tell me, I want to know, what are you concerned about? Are you even worried about China's uh, you know, imminent war posture? Are you concerned about COVID still? What are you actually concerned about? Because I always want to know. I read the comments, as you'll see. I'll show you some coming up soon. I like to know what you think, but if you wanna know what I really think, I, back here at the website, I get to say what I really think about stuff. And that's really important because there are things in the censorship world today I can't still say. But if you come in here and you become a Peak Insider, you will get up to 50% off on sweet, sweet gear like this uh, at our website. So, hey, that's what we do. I like people to be able to identify each other. I've been identified with this in airports. Um, it's fun, fun stuff. So come on by, check out uh, our resilience community if you're concerned about being resilient. So uh, why do people join our site? They join because they like to learn from each other. Mark 100K writing here, post like yours, commenting to another commenter, is yet another reason why I subscribe to Peak Prosperity. Access to others struggling to make sense of our shared reality in this short walk. Thank you. This is kind of comments we have. We have a civil, mature, intelligent community trying to figure out what's going on in the world as well. People sometimes join because they like to know when to act. Uh, Rick was writing about energy. Hey, your message has accelerated me installing solar and batteries and a nat gas generator and then buy an electric car as a backup. We love information that leads to effective action and we support each other around that. That's another reason people come to the website. And finally, they really just, uh, we, we're, hey, it's all about integrity. We are seeing clearly that the world is breaking into two separate camps right now. Those who seem to lack all integrity, they don't care who they harm in the pursuit of ego, greed, and all that other stuff. And then there are people who still care. They have morals. We care about things like beauty, truth, love, and being the best people we can be, learning, growing, all of that. So if you're that kind of person, you're gonna love the community we have over there. And as well, so this person, uh, Dasan Schenkt writing, I was born into post-Soviet collapse Russia and I know what a decayed society and culture looks like. People in the West do not understand how good they have it, nor how fragile all of it is. I see a lot of people and organizations stuck in mental traps and engaging in an intellectual dishonesty to themselves and to others. Chris cuts through all of that on his way to answers based on the available evidence. So. You want to come on by and you want to join the site that's fantastic as i always say come for the information take a few actions to become resilient but stay for the awesome tribe we have now back to our story here's the thing it's not just one thing to erase your history and whip people up about your century of humiliation the first step in war always is dehumanization now i wrote a bunch of pieces back in uh, what was it, 2014 15 ish I think might have been 2016, I'll have to look back, but it was around North Korea. And what I had noted was this preponderance of, look at these articles like this one here coming out, <clears throat> atrocities under Kim Jong-un, indoctrination, prison gulags, you know, executions. We have that one from 2012, North Korea, the world's principal violator of responsibility to protect prisoners and everything. The prison state known as North Korea, 2014. We were suddenly, we were bombarded with all these messages about Korean prison guards doing awful things to women prisoners, to puppies. I mean, it was just like one of these things. 
And I look at that and I know that these stories, even if they're true, there's a reason they're coming out now. So the context of what I'm seeing in the world isn't always important as how you think about it. So when I was reading all of these articles about what North Korean prison guards are doing, what awful human beings they were, that was my clue to know that the United States or some other major power was probably my, the United States was thinking about, hey, we might have to attack these people. So we gotta soften the territory. We gotta conduct a little bit of the psyops here, make sure that our people in our country would be you know, down for that sort of action. I wrote all that, nothing really happened. I was at an event where a gentleman comes up to me he says, hey, can we talk off to the side? This was at a big investment conference. We go over to the side. This gentleman, if you're watching, hey, uh, he had been actually very high up in the military chain of command and said, hey, I was reading your articles at the time. You have no idea how close you were. We had aircraft carrier groups at the time you were writing those articles about North Korea spooled up hot and ready right off the coast because of some things going on. He said, how did you know? I said, well, because you should see the articles that were coming out in the newspapers. It was very obvious what was happening. And then the articles come and, you know, look at this. It's like everybody's talking about what awful things are going on in North Korea. Have you read about North Korea in like the last year? Probably you haven't read anything except every so often, um, you know, the leader of uh, Best Korea, as it's called, shoots a missile into the sea because they don't like the sea for some reason. They're very angry with the sea. But anyway, that's it. Uh, you won't hear about atrocities because they're not on the hot seat. But, you know, this was big. And, you know, we had here the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights is busy engaging in this whole crimes against humanity piece here against North Korea. Uh, Time magazine wrote worse than Nazi camps. That's how bad it is. <laughs> they were worse than Nazi camps. New report details, gruesome crimes against humanity at North Korean prisons. And when was that one? That was 2017. So that was right in that time frame where there was a lot of attention Worse, you know, you can tell. Look at that satellite photo. Um, but anyway, I'm joking. But listen, if there are atrocities, there are not, as I'm sure there are, but there are atrocities all over the place because humans, right? So when you watch them, though, this is how I decode the news. When you see these dehumanization efforts come forward, that's when you know the leadership of that country is doing a little shuck and jive. They're getting ready to lay the territory to make it okay for them to attack, or even better yet, for the citizens to rise up and demand that this leader be executed or that country be attacked. Um, remember this? This was the Saddam, Saddam Hussein edition, right? Back in 2003, tales of Saddam's brutality coming out of the White House directly. They're talking of brutality, torture, fear, death, right? So this is Saddam's brutality. And of course, obviously what happened next was no less brutal for about a million Iraqis who didn't survive the whole shock and on and subsequent campaign, right? But this was how it goes. So when you see this dehumanization, you know what's about to happen and where we're going in this story. How about the Libya edition? Gaddafi, we see here in uh, that 1702, so that's February 17, 2011, Gaddafi's brutal four decades in power, writing in France, Agence, Agence Presse France, uh, is writing about this. So the French are all getting whooped up about what a brutal guy Gaddafi is. Um, whole story there, I don't have time to get into, but honestly, if you compare pre-Gaddafi being taken out to post, there was nothing at all brutal about him. It was a wonderful, peaceful country compared to the absolute hellhole it's become ever since NATO got involved and bombed him out of existence so that, the, well, they bombed his, his convoy so the rebels could capture him. Now, here are those, though. Look, Muammar Gaddafi, war crimes files revealed. So this was from June of 2011. They're beating that drum of dehumanization. What an awful, terrible person this is. He commits war crimes. It's usually in that, you know, they, they torture, they rape, they commit war crimes, they kick puppies, you know, you can, all those things to make this a very, very bad person. And then finally, we have the BBC part of this, Gaddafi's quixotic and brutal rule. This is October 20th, 2011. I'm gonna call that date out directly because it was October 21st that NATO struck a convoy of vehicles uh, on, and they said here, well, you know, uh, we struck the 11 vehicles in an armored convoy that was speeding the late Libyan leader, Muammar Gaddafi, out of his hometown. Um, although NATO didn't know at the time that he was in that convoy. Uh, they said in a statement on Friday. It later came out that not only did they know he was there, but they had radioed to 
the rebels in the area that they were going to stop this convoy and that they, you know, bombed the, the vehicles at the front and the back and then radioed the position. And so not entirely true, but this is how it goes. The first thing you got to do, though, is you got to make him a very, very bad guy. And then you do this. And so this is just something, a set of signals I've learned to read over the years. So why, you know, that's why all of this stands out to me, because I, I recognize this. This is typical, normal behavior, right? Because the common people, we never want war. You kind of have to be convinced that it's the right thing. And one of the convincing sets is you talk about the great century of humiliation. You talk about what a bad person it is that you're up against. You know, you talk about how evil they are, all of that stuff. And when you have those fractures and divisions created and they're strong enough, then you've made the case for war the casus belli, right? So um, here's some data, though, that goes beyond what just China is doing in terms of starting to ring fence their intellectual thought processes around the century of humiliation. We see here, too, in March of 2022, they started really, it was noted like, hey, China's really buying up a lot of food, right? And foodstuffs, corn and soybeans in this case. Um, here, even in December 19th of this year, pretty recent, uh, China buys another million tons of corn, is, and they keep tagging everything on the Ukraine war, like maybe that's the reason. Um, but China's busy stockpiling food, and um, uh, as well, I got to say, you know, um, for your comments, I was really, you know, where do I go with this situation? What do I want to talk about here? Mio wrote here, um, you're marching through this storm like a champion. I have to say thanks for all your hard work, clear explanations. Uh, that's great. One of the clearest analyses of the current economic situation I've heard. Please show GDP versus oil consumption chart to every politician that wants to ban new oil rigs in the U.S. And I put those up there because those were in response to last week's piece, which was the vital connection between oil and the economy. You got to talk about this oil thing again, because if you understand where the energy part of the story is going, then you can build onto this case that I'm making today. So last week's piece around the vital connection between oil and the economy, and trust me, China's not confused about that connection. Only here in the US people seem a little, we uh, leadership seems a little foggy on the whole connection. They're not, I built the case last week that oil and economy are linked, China gets it, so now we have to understand what China's doing in the context of their own oil provisionings. Remember, the EU didn't do anything about provisioning themselves before they got into a war against their major supplier of energy. Um, strategically, not the smartest thing I've ever seen. So what's going on in, with respect to China and oil reserves now? If you've watched last week's piece, you have the context to understand why this is actually big news. That's what I do. I'm a dot connector. This comes to us from February of 2022. It's in Reuters. They write exclusive. China boosts oil reserves, ignoring U.S. push for global release. The U.S. is busy dishoarding its strategic petroleum reserve, the SPR, dishoarding, meaning we're selling it, coming out of the ground and out it goes. Some of it went to China. China was like, thank you very much. We'll take another million barrels per day, right? They were taking a lot of it. Um, and, uh, quote, crude oil inventories in China are up roughly 30 million barrels since mid-November. And look at that down there. At 950 million barrels, that's the total crude oil inventory in February. That's what China was up to. Carrying on, meanwhile, in the United States, we were over here at 650 million barrels because that's 0.65 billion. And now down here at 382 at last count. And a lot of that's called light, sweet crude. It's not actually the stuff our refineries are most excited to have. So. That's a very, very big difference between two separate countries. China piling up food and energy. The United States selling food, disordering its energy. Two totally different strategies for how to be prepared for the future. I believe in being prepared, so I think you know how I feel about that. Um, this is absolutely not intelligent. But China actually has a huge weakness in this story, and it's called the Malacca Strait. And the problem with it is it's a very tiny little straight, it's tiny. It's a little place and almost all of their oil and virtually all of their seabound oil comes through that little tiny strait. Could that be blockaded? Easy. A couple of subs parked off there and nothing's getting through, right? So they have a problem on their hands, but if you see here, they've started to correct this a little bit than they have here. Uh, some things now coming straight from Russia. And so China actually has quite a bit of connections to Russia through Kazakhstan. It actually has 
pipelines that are being built for gas, for oil, for all of those things being able to come from Russia directly, which solves a little bit of this weakness, but not all of it. Now, how are they remedying that weakness? Well, they're importing more and more and more Russian oil. It's hitting a uh, hit a record back here in June. Um, and as well, just even more recently in September in rig zone, we find that from June to August, Russia was China's largest source of crude imports now averaging 1.8 million barrels per day with 1.6 from Saudi Arabia. Real surprise to me to see Russia overtaking Saudi Arabia in that regard. This will only get more pronounced now that the G7 has decided that Russia can't sell its oil to anybody except for $60 a barrel or less, and Russia has the option to just sell it to China. And of course, China is taking no position in terms of saying, you know, Russia's uh, actions in Ukraine make it a pariah. Uh, China's perfectly happy to do business with anybody who wants to do business. Now, interestingly, I actually served on a UN panel for a while. I was invited. I thought, hey, let's go check this out. And it's on sustainable development. And our job on the panel was to actually hand out money, which is fun, right? There was a, a rich businessman from Hong Kong had put up a million dollar per year prize to be handed to somebody doing really cool work in the space of alternative energy, right? So these were like little solar chargers for cell phones that went into the bush of Africa, things like that. Um, so it was fun, but what was fun for me was who else was on there? It was like, I have no idea how I got invited onto that because the other people on there were super senior people at Chinese oil firms, the International Energy Agency, former presidents of, of uh, international oil companies, et cetera, and then me. But I got to talk to these people, and of the people there who are very high up in Chinese politics, they were really clear about this. Now, this was, what, four or five years ago now, but they were very clear, and they said, look, we know that the world future is going to be dominated by who has access to resources. They're busy developing access to resources. I said, well, you know, yeah, but, you know, the United States is kind of a powerful military. And they, th this gentleman just scoffed and said, okay, I said, Chris, the business of China's business, the business of the United States is war. We make friends. We have magic checkbook diplomacy. We'll go around, we'll buy our way in, and we will have a shot at these resources. By the way, some of them you cannot protect by military might. There's not a chance in the world that, you know, if a big kinetic breakout of war breaks out, the chance of oil traveling over the sea in these big, slow, leaky, potentially leaky, potentially explosive, potential environmental disaster if they hull gets breached, oil container ships, the very large crude containers, at zero. Like, that, that won't happen. Like, those things will stop. So that'll just, everything changes, right? So at any rate, if we look here, we also see that down below, China's largest crude import source uh, from Saudi Arabia decreased 9% in the June to August period compared with the three months before the invasion. In imports from Iraq, China's third most common source of crude imports decreased 27% in the same period. In contrast, imports from Russia increased by 7%. So you can clearly see the tail here. And the tail is one of that I believe is told by this map. And that's exactly what I would be doing if I were at all concerned about my seaborne access to oil being compromised in any way, shape, or form, which it immediately would be if anything got kinetic. And I'd be looking for more and more ways to bring oil into my country if I was China through pipelines and through other things that would be much more difficult to disrupt than a seaborne lane. All right, carrying on. So is that all? Well, no, actually we have this from November where uh, Xi Jinping uh, tells China's army to focus on preparation for war. Here he is looking um, pretty, pretty snappy in his fatigues, camo fatigues. And he wrote here, quote, um, he said here, I'm just quoting now from the Guardian article, quote, Xi Jinping has told the People's Liberation Army to focus all its energy on fighting in preparation for war. A Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece has reported pictures of Xi who recently secured a third term as party leader in his army uniform during a visit to a command center featured prominently on the front page of the People's Daily on Wednesday. Xi said the army must comprehensively strengthen military training in preparation for war. Having warned at a recent party congress of dangerous storms on the horizon. What dangerous storms would those be? What is this all about? So um, this is actually getting fairly interesting now. 
And I tend to take people at their word. So, you know, I'm that guy, right? If somebody says they're going to do something and it happens, I'm, I don't know. Maybe they did it, right? So let's carry on with this particular story. Um, this is also still in that same Guardian article I was just quoting from. And I need to know, is this right? Quote, he's sending a message to the United States and Taiwan, says Willie Lam, a senior fellow at the Washington-based Jamestown Foundation. Although China's military strength was not yet at a par with the U.S., Xi's decision-making was not always based on rational calculation, he said. Ooh, you hear that? That guy's kind of a little bit of a nut. <laughs> That's not actually anything that I've heard before. I always thought he was pretty rational, but maybe Willie Lamb knows more than me uh, about this, uh, or maybe this is just propaganda that's meant to shape the narrative. Who knows? Xi made a veiled attack on the U.S.'s increasingly explicit support for Taipei, Taiwan, at the 20th Party Congress, which in concluded in Beijing last month, blaming foreign interference for exacerbating tensions. Foreign interference. Now, remember where we started all this with this idea that China is busy controlling the narrative, controlling the, the, the flow of people into and out of its country, controlling the idea that they had a century of humiliation at the hands of foreigners. So, so the century of humiliation is all about foreign interference. And now they're raising that dog whistle term again, like, hey, we don't like the foreign interference. Now you hear that and you go, oh yeah, they don't like foreign interference. But inside China, that probably lands a lot differently, probably lands a lot harder. If particularly you've been reading about how bad this foreign interference has been and how much face the country lost and how humiliating it was. And it was not good, right? It's not a good piece of history. So they got that going for them. Now, it's just like if you were in the United States and you just, all you heard all the time was your national state-sponsored media telling you how bad Putin is all the time and how he's you know the worst person ever and all of that. Eventually, you might begin to believe that that's actually the case. Don't forget, you were also supposed to believe the same thing was true about North Korea recently and Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi and I could go on and on and on. It's just how the game works. Okay, so let's look at this again. Is Willie Lamb right about saying here that it might just be, you know, he's just sending a message, although it's maybe not entirely rational. I, you know, just, I don't know, maybe he's just a nut. Um, this was an interesting article here in The Diplomat and the person here wrote, said China's never again mentality, Western analysts often overlook how much of China's modern day policy is driven by the collective trauma of its colonial past. Quote, understanding the factors behind China's grand strategy often provides a daunting and elusive task for Western analysts studying the emerging Asian superpower. An often overlooked aspect of Beijing's collective mentality is that China is the first power to challenge the United States that truly rose from its post-colonial past. While analysts often cite the century of humiliation as a driving force in Beijing's policies, they too often ignore exactly how this collective trauma manifests itself in China's never again mentality. Okay. So they say you really shouldn't overlook this mentality. Look at all these people lined up here for the Nanjing, Nanjing uh, Massacre Memorial and uh, the uh, Japanese in Nanjing, not cool. And, but clearly we have a lot of young people here that are lined up and there's a, there's a big push here to, to remember this particular event. And that's how it goes. So let me just, let's just build this thought out just a little bit. Cause I, I you know, again, I'm not a Chinese Sino expert, I, but I do think that we just need to have a little bit of an appreciation for what might be going on here because not least of which is the so-called leaders of the Western world seem to have lost their collective minds. They don't understand risk reward anymore. They lost that on medical uh, treatments. They've lost it around like engaging other nuclear superpowers. So the potential here is that we're actually being led by people who are just dummies or ideologues or dangerous neocons or something. They're just people who, who frankly don't quite understand how the world works. And you kind of know this is the case when you see Henry Kissinger coming out and saying, hey, maybe we should like get some negotiations going over here in, the, in this thing. When Henry Kissinger is telling you you've gone too far, you've gone too far. Um, trust me on that one. So this is what China has not forgotten. Let, let's talk about these American humiliations. So this here coming out of, I guess, UNLV from that same link I gave you before down here. Um, <clears throat> so what were they? So Americans joined the opium trade right after 1776, 1844. U.S.-China treaty allowed five treaty ports, uh, U.S. missionaries, extraterritoriality, 
missionary is very important. At that time, China believed that supreme, uh, supreme authority came through the emperor, right, in the dynasty. And the missionaries are over there going, eh, no, it actually comes from this thing called God, right? And, and so that was a, a, to accept missionaries was actually a huge affront. So that's a lot packed into that word. Uh, 1882 to 43, the China, Chinese Exclusion Act banned Chinese immigration to the U.S. Hmm. 1900 to 1901, U.S. Marines invaded Beijing to fight the Boxer Rebellion, which was against Western imperialism. 1906 to 43, the U.S. Court for China in Shanghai had jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters. And at the 1918 Treaty of Versailles, German concessions in China were given to Japan, um, hmm, creating the May 4th Movement. So, so lots and lots of things. And by the way, this bullet list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And they remember all that and they're taught about it. And so this is why we see, so when we see something like this, uh, it's probably more about China remembering its history than Willie Lamb here trying to convince us that it's just, that maybe the guy's just a nut, you know, not always rational. Um, so at any rate, let's finish this out now. And uh, we're seeing things like this now are showing up. Uh, never forget the national humiliation. Obviously you got school children here, never, rem never forgetting. Um, we have this example here, we, hey, nice QR code. So you can never forget the national humiliation and maybe find some more content there. And what else we got here? Um, yeah, it, it keep going on and on. But at any rate, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about now at Peak Prosperity. I gotta go now, I'm gonna go with my subscribers. We're gonna talk about part two of this, which is about this fifth generation warfare that's absolutely underway. And I do believe uh, the comment that came through YouTube, I found it there, Fortitude of the Sun, triple six, it says there's absolutely no way for governments to handle any kind of challenges like we see in the near future with the amount of care that would be sensible. And that's absolutely the case. So if you're interested in hearing what I think about that, you gotta come on down, you're gonna have to subscribe because that's how we keep the trolls out, that's how we keep the bots out, that's how we keep the conversation civil, and that's how you know I can speak my actual mind. So for now, I just need you to be aware, not super urgent, not like tonight, tomorrow, you know, but China is definitely doing what I consider to be the sensible early precautionary steps for what you would do if you were going to potentially get in a war. You get your people prepared for it, you stock up on the food, and you stock up on the fuel. I don't know why Europe didn't do any of that stuff, kind of weird, but perhaps their leadership isn't quite up to the task, which is actually fortitude of the sun's comment here is one I believe in, which is that, well, all the signs I have say that the countries I, I, the country I live in, the other countries of people who tend to follow my work, we're not led by people who have our best interests at heart. And let's just admit something, they don't know what they're doing. Or if they do, then they're criminally treasonous. I don't know which is worse. Are they just completely inept or are they being intentionally destructive? I don't know which way it falls, but either way, we have to understand the lay of the land, have the appropriate context so that we can begin to take the appropriate actions so that we can be resilient. And the best way to be resilient is to be within and among like-minded people. That's your tribe. So that's what we do at Peak Prosperity. We gather a tribe of people. If you wanna hear more analysis like this, come on by. Hey, I'm there all week. I'm there every week. So thanks for listening today. Can't wait to hear what you have to say about this. Let me know what comments you want me to be reading in the future and talking about. And um, hey, maybe I'll get to them. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye.